Welcome to the Hudson Institute. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm Brian Clark. I'm a senior fellow here at the Institute. I'm director also of the uh, Hudson Center for Defense Concepts and Technology. Uh, I'm here today with Dr. Dan Pat, who is also a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Uh, and we are honored to have with us as our guests uh, two senior leaders from the United States Air Force who've uh, made their way over here from the Pentagon to talk about uh, what the Air Force is doing in uh, cyberspace and the electromagnetic spectrum, as well as intelligence uh, in both their budget and also into their future year's defense plans. So uh, Lieutenant General Richard Moore, um, who is here, is the uh, Deputy Chief of Staff for Plans and Programs. So he's in charge of pulling together the uh, Air Force budget and program, uh, which is not a, it's kind of a thankless job, at, uh, but it's a necessary job, obviously, to get something pulled together that can turn into a budget and then go over to Capitol Hill. Uh, also with us is Lieutenant General Leah Lauerbach, uh, who, and she is the uh, head of uh, Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence, uh, Surveillance and Reconnaissance, and Cyber Effects at the Headquarters Air Force. So uh, two senior leaders uh, from the Air Force, from the A8 and from the A2A6, uh, here to talk to us a little bit about uh, cyber and electromagnetic spectrum operations. So thank you, generals, for being here today. Thanks for the invite. Um, we, um, you know, the, the big kind of the big looming question right now is what's happening over on Capitol Hill with regard to the, the program and the budget and the appropriations uh, and the authorizations that have to come out of that. Um, so with the Air Force's uh, 2024 uh, proposed budget, um, you know, how are you trying to address the challenges uh, and the opportunities um, that exist uh, in cyberspace, the electromagnetic spectrum, you know, and in ISR? Sure. So the Air, Force, the Air Force budget in general tries to balance between portfolios. There's no such thing as a zero risk program. No company has unlimited money and ours is no different. And so across the portfolios that we have to see to everything from child development centers to airlift to electromagnetic spectrum operations, we try and balance the risk within each of those portfolios. And I think we did a reasonable job in the, in the FY24 program. So the FY24 budget was presented to Congress in late April. It has now gone through hearings and markup. Three of the four committees have marked. We have the, the House Appropriations Committee for Defense, the House Armed Services Committee, and the Senate Armed Services Committee. We have their marks. The Senate Appropriations Committee for Defense, we should have their marks sometime in the next 10 days or so. They're, they're uh, planning to be complete by the end of the month. And so uh, within the, uh, the ISR portfolio, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, um, we, largely, we largely held that portfolio steady with one notable exception, and that is we continued to, uh, to increase the procurement of the E7. Mm -hmm. uh, so the E3, the AWACS, uh, 1980s era, completely analog aircraft. The mission computer inside weighs about 25,000 pounds. Uh, that will transition to an all-digital uh, E7 phase array radar, all digital processing, lots of connectivity, lots of communications. Uh, and it is of note also flown by the Australians and the British and being purchased by other of our allies and partners. So a great way for us to share mission responsibility. Uh, in the uh, electromagnetic spectrum operations uh, portfolio, uh, the kind of big things there are, um, we are getting very close to the new radar on the F-35. That will be a dramatic increase in our ability uh, to operate um, with electronic warfare and electromagnetic spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum operations um, kinds of things. Uh, and then the F-15E and F-15EX electronic protection and, uh, and warning suite, so EPAWS, uh, those, those things are all continuing. So uh, there, there's, uh, if you add all of those together, it's a few tens of billions that are in our five-year program. Uh, and of course, there are some other activities as well. I think the most notable non-platform activity is the uh, Spectrum Warfare Wing. It will stand up at Eglin and the, the, uh, the primary purpose will be to ingest and characterize newly observed um, things in the electromagnetic spectrum and then be able to turn them into a mission data file in not real time, but darn near, and retransmit that out to the field so that once we've observed something, everybody can understand how we've characterized it. Right. Great point. Uh, so, uh, General Lauterbach, mm -hmm. um, when we, you know, okay. <laughs> uh, the, um, 
in the FY24 program, you know, what are some of the main challenges uh, that you see you know, facing our, you know, the Air Force's ability to operate in cyberspace and the spectrum and, and be able to gain intelligence and, and conduct reconnaissance? Yeah. And how are, how are you trying to address that? Mm -hmm. So, well, teaming very much with Rick, right? right? I mean, this is a, it's a, a team effort from everyone that's up at the, uh, up at the, uh, on the air staff as well as uh, at the MAGCOMs. I mean, that's a re we identify what those requirements are for, for uh, um, uh, for war fighting, and then uh, right, Rick has to do his magic and, and you know determine you know what it is that we're all going to pay for, and knowing that we're not going to be able to pay for everything. Um, from my perspective, uh, just a couple of other things I would hit on um, in those programs. But let me start with uh, the actual threat, okay? And so, so we got a, a young crowd here that I see of a number of folks. I, I want to understand and or just take the opportunity to educate. Um, if you're not already tracking, I mean, what it is that we're up against uh, and why it is then that we see these as challenges or opportunities. But that threat is, um, is us preparing ourselves for a conflict. Uh, and that conflict is probably with a peer competitor, and that peer competitor is China. Um, we, have, we have to know uh, the threat, and that's part of my job as the, the senior intelligence officer, is to ensure that uh, those around me understand what that, uh, what that threat might look like now, what it looks like in 2030, what, what it looks like in 2049. And if I, I'll just state that you know, uh, a lot of times when these uh, senior leaders that are in, in um, you know, uh, uh, presidents of other nations, they tell us what it is that they are going to do, right? In public, they are telling us. And so, uh, so the Chinese, of course, has stated that they want to be a world-class military by 2049, a global world-class military in 2049. Um, they, let me just go and run down some of the, you know, like a by the numbers type of look at it. Now, this doesn't talk about capabilities or the, the capacity that they might have, but, um, and I, I wouldn't be able to talk too much about that, uh, um, at the, you know, today. But um, just a couple of months ago, they announced that they want to increase their defense spending from, uh, uh, from the 2022 budget by 7.2%. Um, the Navy, uh, by 2025, will be the world's largest Navy. Um, they have a robust air defense system um, out to, uh, you know, hundreds of nautical miles, which is, uh, for us, extremely uh, significant and, and, um, and discouraging to be able to fly through. Uh, Long-range SAMS force, the largest in the world. Um, since 2015, they've put on orbit. Uh, their presence has, uh, has increased by 379%, um, hundreds and hundreds of satellites. Uh, launched 135 ballistic missiles, all in test, all right, all in test uh, since 2021. That is the, um, uh, a large, the largest number of all of the other countries in the world combined, okay, to test that many ballistic missiles. And their strategic force that they use those for uh, is very significant. Um, cyber es espionage, of course, persistent threats or, or desiring to get to a persistent threat, um, not only in uh, critical infrastructure within the uh, United States and other nations, but uh, certainly in the Department of Defense networks. They want to have an attack capability in cyber, and then from an electro, uh, uh, electromagnetic warfare um, uh, perspective, they understand that that is absolutely critical uh, to any, uh, any war fighting um, capability that they want to have. So um, I always say that you know, it, they've been modernizing for 20 years, and we've, we, we continue to see them modernize, right, increase uh, capabilities, but also uh, enhance their um, enhance their capabilities. But they are a modern military. Nobody should have any other idea of that uh, at this point. They are a modern military, and um, uh, and we need to get we need to get ready for it. So, hence the budget. Um, just a couple of other things that I would say from an ISR perspective. Um, you know, we have a uh, we have an opportunity, and we can talk more about it and other questions of going to a space-based um, uh, capability. So, um, so a capacity that will will allow us to have, if we do this right, uh, develop an infrastructure that uh, de develop an architecture and an infrastructure that allows us to have you know persistence in a lot of places in the world that we would like to have. Um, the uh, from an IMSO perspective, uh, General Moore spoke to the Spectrum Warfare Wing. We'll stand up another. Another aspect of that wing, uh, the, uh, the Spectrum Warfare Group will uh, stand up here this fall or, or uh, in the spring. I mean, think of software techniques, cognitive EW techniques um, that we are experimenting with and, and know that we would need to get to and, uh, and field. And then the last thing I would say on IMSO is um, battle management capability. Uh, so these are all conversations that we're having, and in some cases, right, um, putting money towards experimentation, um, and, you know, developing out the beginnings of these. Uh, but we've got to, you know, to, to be able to fight in, a, in a, a home game for China, right? Home game for China, away game for us is, uh, is significant. And we know in all of these areas we're going to have to uh, uh, get a little bit better.
Yeah, in general, with, with those numbers, uh, right, it, it's, it's pretty stark that, that with the distance that the U.S. has to operate forward in the Pacific, it doesn't seem likely that the U.S. can win if it's just a pure numbers game, right? It has to be fighting differently. Mm -hmm. And, uh, General, one of the things you brought up that I found really uh, exciting was what you talked about, the spectrum warfare ring, and being able to take information off sensors, turn it around quickly into a mission data file, operationalizing intelligence. Feels like this kind of theme is probably at the heart of fighting better. And you know, that software and information technologies are, are feel like they're right at the heart of future military capability. Can you talk a little bit about some of what the Air Force is doing uh, to create adaptability in software? So it's not a you know always waiting five years for the next block upgrade to become more agile and adaptable. Sure. So uh, a couple of things. First of all, uh, you know, the inherent in this conversation is the ability to move large amounts of data over large distances. And so in the Department of the Air Force, not U.S. Air Force specifically, but in the U.S. Space Force, one of the primary contributions to this is the space data transport layer, which is, among other things, a very large constellation of uh, proliferated low Earth orbit satellites that essentially will create a mesh network over the Pacific. Uh, very challenging to do that over, over such a huge geography. When you fly from Washington, D.C. to Honolulu, you're only halfway to Guam. It is an immense place to be able to, to have to operate in. So that's the first thing is the ability to move this data around. And then the next thing, agility and software, is uh, th this is one of the things that we're working really hard on. We have a couple of software factories in the Air Force that are working on that most notably in Boston, uh, Kessel Run, One Beacon Street, right downtown in Boston. And the reason for that is they want their door to be open so that they can exchange ideas and, and leverage best practices that are going on in the software industry. They specifically are working on the software behind our air operations centers. And one of the places that that's adapted is when the, when the suite that they're working on right now called Kratos, when that releases, the physical building, the place called an air operations center won't have to exist anymore there's an opportunity for everybody to share the same picture but not be in the same building. And right now, we can't, we can't do that. But we're headed that way. Um, that's just one example of what you're talking about. But I think in this particular case, it's very powerful because we have four air operation centers in the Pacific. Uh, and if one of them goes away by accident or by malice, we have the ability with the new software suite to transition all of that workload. And all of it doesn't have to move wholesale from one air operation center to another. Yeah. Can I just talk to the the expertise, right, the people um, that make that happen? So right, so we've so we started this a number of years ago, sending our youngest, our best and brightest, um, who who have a knack for this. I mean, I feel like at some point I was the best and brightest, but never had a knack <laughs> for this, right? Um, so the, uh, the these young folks that we've sent to Kessel Run and other other uh, labs. Uh, doing great things. Part of my job is um, as the functional authority for for the cyber folks within the Air Force is to um, it, how do we develop and how do how do we develop that expertise across a wider array of folks, right? And not just a boutique kind of thing. Um, and so we've um, we we're doing that from a, a manpower or a training perspective, uh, and I'll call it the technical track. So this is something new and different that in the Air Force we haven't we haven't done. You know, you come up in the Air Force as a here are the you know uh, as a lieutenant, a captain, you know, and here are the things that you need to do: be a flight commander, right? Learn leadership, be a ta you know tactician, yada yada, and then you move up to uh, squadron command and group command, those types of things. Um, and, and we're losing some folks that uh, don't necessarily want to you know don't want to have that job jar of leader, you know, commander, commander kind of thing. They know that they're going to be a leader, and we absolutely want them to be all leaders in the in the service. But uh, we also want them to have this expertise that today we just don't have, um, or we don't get necessarily um, out of the officer corps anyhow. And so we're we're developing right now. We've got a pilot that um, is about to start. I will say, uh, we're working with our uh, fellow uh, teammates in the A1 community to um, to determine how do we keep somebody a young officer who um, who's maybe been trained, exquisitely trained. Uh, with U.S. Cyber Command tools and right software capabilities and uh, that type of thing, and then uh, uh, and then keep them on this same track. Maybe give them leadership opportunities in that, but um, still uh, maintaining an expert, growing the expertise in that technical track, and not having to go a different route. Right. So, 
something new and different for us. It really hi highlights uh, kind of the, the importance of the information domain to, or the information environment in terms of getting mm. military advantage. I mean, we talk about you know, how do we distribute the AOC? How do we improve its functionality? How do we make it more adaptable? That's about making our own decision making more effective and improving our own ability to, to use information, gather information. Um, yeah, are we uh, you know, building the kind of capabilities we need to be able to you know, both improve the quality and speed of our decision making as well as degrade that of opponents? Do we need yeah. to think about this? It's a you know, two-sided competition. It's not just about us yeah. getting better. Can we make the other guy not as good? And so bet, yeah. how do the Chinese view that? And then is there a way that we can sort of impact that okay. with our operations? Yeah, uh, well, the Chinese view information dominance as a, you know, a prerequisite to any war fighting that they're going to do. And, you know, we have... Uh, um, uh, an understanding, I would say, that from a cyber capability, I mean, we will expect uh, expect um, uh, attacks, uh, you know, trying to disrupt our information, uh, the information domain for us, trying to, you know, whatever that might be. Absolutely, we understand that that's, uh, it's, the information dominance is, um, is a requirement for the Chinese in war fighting. I, I, we think the same thing, though, right? I mean, this is not, yeah, and it's not that we haven't been doing it. Uh, let me couch it in four ways, um, and you you captured like two of these. In the information environment, um, you've got to have, uh, think of um, informing. So as an intelligence professional, uh, my number one job is to be informing uh, the operator, the decision maker, whomever that is, or the boots on the ground, right? Uh, number two, I, we need to be able to protect all of the information, our own information space, right? And if that's through uh, communications, uh, cyber defense, that type of thing, um, absolutely. Uh, uh, so think of those two things on the, the left-hand side of the chart, if you will, as to informing and defending, and those are things that Blue does. On the, uh, what we want to do on the red side of the house is that we want to be able to influence, and then perhaps we want to be able to attack. Uh, so from an information warfare perspective, we've got to think of it in all of those four areas, um, and I'll talk here to influence. So um, information, uh, information uh, operations. Okay, just one aspect of this. And a few years ago, I'll say maybe seven years ago, eight years ago, we actually came up with a new uh, specialty code, and that's the information operator. We did not have that previously. We didn't. Ha we weren't grooming and growing uh, those experts, um, folks that eat, bleed, breathe, and you know, right, sleep uh, information operations. And so now we have some. Uh, we've got almost 200 of these officers, and they're all. It's an all-in officer corps. Uh, and uh, these are, right, just, I, I would just went down to the um, training class uh, a few months ago, and it's just so great to see all these young lieutenants, uh, but they're all folks with social sciences degrees, behavioral, right, behavioral science, uh, psychology, how do you get in the mind of the adversary, whomever that is, right? And then, so how do you influence what it is that you want that, what's the behavior that you want to see uh, from that adversary? And so that's a, a large aspect of um, certainly growing that. I would say, We've done this well at a tactical level um, for many decades, okay? I mean, this is tactical deception is a, a part of that, uh, military deception, right? That's an aspect of all of that. And we've done that well. Where, where we struggle is institutionalizing it, um, growing the capability, and then I would say at a strategic level, trying to synchronize, um, especially when you have a, uh, a capability or a, a peer competitor like Russia or China, how do you get the whole of government thinking the same thing uh, and, and so the service, of course, is not, we've got our small part in it, uh, but we're not, uh, not going to lead that. But uh, yeah, so th those are some of the, the right, pieces uh, and parts that we've got from a, uh, from a service perspective. There's a force design element of this, too, General Warren, that you know, if you build the force in a way that's predictable and you, know, you can't do, you kind of operates the way it operates, right? Um, then you're reducing the ability of your force to you know, create deception or, or to confuse the enemy. So if you basically are fielding a bunch of, you know, kind of the, Tack air looks like the tack air of the past. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have a lot of different pieces to move around or compose. Do we? Or are we trying to make the force more diversified from a you know force design perspective? Absolutely, and I would say that that phenomenon that you're talking about that doesn't have to be. Yeah, it doesn't have to be that just because you've built one kind of a force based on a particular set of tack air platforms that you can only use them in the ways that we've always used them especially when you consider the connectivity and the collection aspects of the platforms that we have now, they can be used very differently. And so if you constrain your thinking and therefore constrain your force, it becomes predictable and therefore not particularly useful or survivable. That doesn't have to be the case though. Right. Can I give you a perfect example of that would be uh, <clears throat> the RQ-1. We started the RQ-1 as a right, unmanned aerial vehicle, uh, a drone that you hear about the drones in the, you know, in the, in the 
or Washington Post and whatnot. Mm -hmm. That RQ-1 started, it was a ISR platform. We, uh, then we decided to put weapons on it, bombs on it, missile, air to air missiles on it, right? And so MQ-1, then it became the MQ-9, and now it's some, right, something that absolutely you get the, some persistence but you, uh, from an ISR perspective, but now you have an attack capability that the adversary might not be expecting, so yeah. So you've brought up these, these two themes here. We've talked about these intangible things, which are increasingly important, cyber effects, MSO effects, information operations, and we've talked about the, importance of adaptability in the force. How are these intangible things and this adaptability, how's that rolling into tests and training? Whether it's the facilities, the venues, how we think about it from the personnel side. Can you offer some insights there? Yeah, so let me give you two, two quick thoughts on this. The first thing is, if you want to talk about our highest end adversary, you have to talk about our highest end capabilities. And if you want to test those high end capabilities, you have to be very careful how you do that. You would, there are a lot of things that our platforms can do now that we don't want to do in open air because we don't want any of that to be seen. And so what you have to, what you have to consider is how you do test in a little bit different way. How can you, how can you do test in a high end, high fidelity, high quality simulation environment so that you can collect the kind of data that you're thinking about that will tell you if your weapon systems are going to perform or not, but not do that in open air. Mm -hmm. We've always done this on the Nellis test and training range. It's the highest end range there is, but there are things that we won't do there. Now transition to the simulated world, and now the way we do this for the F-35 is with the joint simulation environment. In fact, a qualification for initial operational capability for the F-35 is completion of the joint simulation environment. It has always been that Items that test were too expensive to use for training, and items that train weren't uh, high precision enough to use for test. JSC is the first time that we've started to see those come together. And so the training platform for the F-35 will be the joint simulation environment. We will use all of the things that were developed for the kind of testing that you're talking about that we don't want to do in open air. That's the same kinds of things you need to train on that you don't want to do in open air. And so we see this convergence of test assets and training assets, and it's the first time we've really been able to do that in any kind of a cost-effective manner and still accomplish the goals of both communities. It's very exciting. And it sounds like JSC is growing, you know, it's, it's growing to encompass more than, than just the F-35 as a system, right? You have to think about, you know, space data transport and space-based systems. All of that. And, yeah. and so JSC is envisioned to contain all of the Night One fighters. Yeah. Anything that's going to be a part of the first force package that goes forward on Night One, we want to bring that into the joint simulation environment, and that will be where they all train together. Um, we will build out additional locations. The Virtual Test and Training Center at Nellis will be the next yeah. one uh, to get JSE uh, as a part of its training suite, and that'll become the high-end high -end training capability yeah. that we have. In the cyber world, I think there's some of the similar challenges, obviously. Where oh, uh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, so, and, you know, I also want you to remember and think that uh, uh, as a service, we're doing OT&E. Um, so when we talk about cyber, um, uh, cyber ranges, uh, yes, um, we've got some of that in the Air Force, but a lot of that will be in U.S. Cyber Command as well. Uh, because they're, they've got the offense, defense uh, type, of, um, uh, type of missions. Though at some point, and I, I'll just speak to it at this point, like there is a cyber, uh, let me make two, a distinction here between cyber and communication. So um, yes, I've got the A6 uh, uh, function within, uh, in my portfolio. Uh, and, a, and a number of years ago, say 12 or 13 years ago, we started, we, we just went away from the term communications and we talked about, we called it all cyber. Uh, and I think that we've confused ourselves and confused um, a, lots of, a lot of other folks that, uh, that there is still uh, boots on the ground, expeditionary communications, a communicator, there's a comm squadron at every base, right? You have to have a commu these communicators to be able to, uh, right, for any of us to do, to do our jobs on a daily basis. As well, expeditionary communications will be a necessity um, as you know, in any deployment that we're in. I mean, today, that's, that's the absolute truth. And whether it's agile combat in, uh, employment or if it's just deploying uh, to, to some area around the world, break, the other part of that then is cyber, right? And so I think of cyber as this, these are the offensive capabilities that we want to have, our defensive capabilities of our own networks, or maybe it's critical infrastructure, whatever it might be. And these are the airmen that we are presenting then to the U.S. Cyber Command for you know, under their authorities to do uh, the missions that uh, com they wish or combatant commands wish. Um, we, of course, want airmen to be part of that because uh, there's an air-minded mission in every single combatant command, right? And so we want that to uh, we want to be we want to be a part of that. 
But what we also now are seeing, and it's not just now, but just in the last few years though, I want to call it cyber enabled air superiority. Okay, so for our tactical air missions that we're flying in anywhere we are around the world, if there's something that's coming at us from a, a cyber perspective, a cyber attack on that small base, and maybe that base is just a, uh, a it's a single runway, and it, it's not a real built up, right, robust base, but uh, just a single runway, but we've got uh, fighters that are operating out of that. We need to have a capability there to defend ourselves, and then perhaps an act of defense, right? Go on in the attack. Uh, from a cyber perspective, and so so we are we're building this out now. We're going to stand up um, and not stand up, but we're going to remission uh, a guard unit in uh, Mansfield, Ohio, uh, to become a, a cyberspace mission and uh, a cyberspace wing, and they're going to take on this uh, c cyber enabled air superiority mission for us. Uh, they won't be the only ones, but um, uh, but you know a capacity capability that uh, that will help us on the regular Air Force side of the house. But uh, I'm really excited about where it is that we might go from that organic standpoint. Yeah, and it's really interesting because you see each of the services have have this challenge of how do you put cyber to work at the tactical level. And you know the Army obviously that's very much where they're kind of centered is on using RF enabled cyber capabilities. At yeah, the yeah, level. yeah. I think um, RF, the Navy. RF, yeah, I think um, RF capabilities, space enabled capabilities, whatever, whatever that might be. It, it doesn't have to be through one single inject access right. point, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jim, all right. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, well yeah. all right. So a topic of, <laughs> of some personal interest of, of mine is, again, back to these intangible things, cyber, MSO. How do you program for that? How do you get that into the budget? How do you, how does it defend something that's like MCEL or cyber in a budget process where there's, there's very clear platforms uh, that feel tangible, everybody understands what that means for their constituency? How do these, you know, information age technologies that cut across different weapon systems and are more threat aligned than system aligned, you know, how do, yeah, how do you program for that? So this becomes a little bit of a challenge. At the, at the end of the day, you can't program a concept. You can't program a strategy, you can't program a theory. You can program a list of line items that you can go and buy, and you can put more or less money against them, and you can do it sooner or later in the planning horizon. That's it. And so by the time it makes it into the program, it is tangible, because you have to go and buy a thing in the resourcing process. You can't, you can't buy a concept. Those things are all made in somebody's district, and so there's a tie to all of these things. But where it gets a little squishy is when you start to talk about the impact or the effects that they create. First of all, a lot of them are classified beyond the level that you can discuss in polite company. And second of all, some of them are very difficult to describe. And they're not things that you see on the ramp every day. In fact, a lot of our cyber payloads, the reason we test them on a cyber range that is completely disconnected from the rest of the world is because many of them are disposable. You launch that payload one time, and whatever mechanism you use, that doesn't exist anymore. You only get one shot at that. And so because a lot of these things don't show up on a ramp and you can't count them every day and make sure you still have all of them, that becomes a little more nebulous. Uh, but the, the way they fit into the battle and the way they will be used against us, those are all pretty clear. And at the end of the day, by the time they make it into the program, it's a list of things to go and buy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah, I just think uh, it's difficult. It is so tricky to I got be able this. to. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Um, it's uh, you know because there's an IT portfolio, uh, but not not a warfighting portfolio, right? So IT portfolio, but things that we have to have in order to have VTCs and uh, email and all that kind of good stuff that has to happen for us to to work on a daily basis. Then you've got the cyber portfolio. If it's um, uh, defensive or offensive. Uh, think the expeditionary communications. I mean, so there are kits, expeditionary communication kits that um, that General Moore has to purchase for us, or or you know, give me the money to purchase, and then we can go out and do those um, expeditionary uh, communications and at you know, island X, Y, or Z type of thing. So you're not so. having the money, and you may not get the kits. Yeah. <laughs> Just to manage expectations. <laughs> Thanks. I'm glad you got your default answer in there. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so to kind of you know continue the discussion about the program and what we are and what are not able to do, um, the Air Force is going through a kind of a generational recap of its ISR aircraft and its ISR capabilities. Uh, and General Lauterbach, you talked a little bit about space capabilities. Mm -hmm. Now they're kind of growing as a, a contributor to, to ISR in the future. But we're still buying a lot of air-breathing aircraft that are going to go out and, and do things in the in the aerial there. Um, so what's the um, you know, what, what are we how are we approaching that um, and how do we value the those 
air breathing wide body aircraft for the most part or slow moving aircraft um, you know versus the kinds of threat they're going to face and then how do we mitigate those those challenges um, so you know first you okay yeah absolutely so um, so I would say that we're mo you know in the midst of modernizing our ISR aerial ISR capability um, let me start with uh, you know, so, I mean I spent two years on the Space Force staff as the senior Intel officer over there. Um, I've also spent most of my career, all of my career as an intelligence officer, so I've been a member of the intelligence community, right? So I understand what it is that the intelligence community has uh, on orbit to do uh, collection, um, et cetera. And then uh, as a Space Force stood up, uh, we, we knew that we were going to be able to have, we, we should have some game. We should have a role in, uh, in providing the military, the Department of Defense for um, uh, ISR. I mean, it just gives us a persistence. Uh, and if we, you know, developing whatever type of sensor, it could, you know, be as good, better, doesn't, right? Those are the things, the things that we're talking about at this point. But there's just, um, you know, JSTARS as an example. Uh, from a GMTI perspective, uh, you know, it, it is a, it's a war fighting capability. Uh, I mean, it helps me as the intelligence officer to understand, to be able to track where uh, the bad guys are going. And so um, if we can have that capability from on orbit and with more persistence, and, uh, and looking in the places that we want around the world, then I mean, we should, right, we should be able to do that. And so we're moving out in uh, those types of capabilities. Um, so what it means then from an airborne perspective, I think, is that you know, we, we, have to comp we, we need to complement. It's not just airborne, it's the ground layer, it's the um, subsurface layer also has ISR capabilities, right? And so we need to be thinking more um, as a, uh, uh, it doesn't matter what sensor or where it's coming from, but we have to be thinking about the data. Uh, and so you, you'll also see us moving and in, in, uh, in that direction of uh, developing, uh, I mean, General Moore spoke about it, uh, mesh networks. I mean, just getting the information to wherever it needs to be. Um, and that intelligence, from my perspective, is, uh, you know, it starts, it starts in indications and warning. It starts way left of any conflict, right? I mean, we're doing this on a daily basis. Um, and then I want to get into a, a space where we can do this, um, a find, fix, track, target, engage, and assess the F2T2EA uh, to be able to provide, again, intelligence to finding and fixing, tracking, so that somebody can go out and, uh, uh, and target that, that whatever it might be, right? And so we need to get that at a speed and scale uh, that we think will, will still keep us in a, uh, in a good place against a, uh, a competitor. Because one of the challenges with that is going to be orchestrating that constellation of ISR capabilities, right? Because we're used to kind of having an organic asset that's attached to a unit that you call on and say, where's this guy? Can I shoot him? What, where's the target? Give me the mensurated target information and I'll mm -hmm. engage him. Yeah. But here you're talking about where you might have a changing constellation or a changing set of providers you know, to that yes. warfighter yes. because it may be space yeah. and then that may yeah. go away and then the aircraft may have to leave because it's too. And it doesn't have threat. to be an ISR platform, right? It could be, it, it could be an F-35. It could, yeah. be, it could right. be anything. Right. That's the thing, right? And we need to be able to bring all of those together. Right. Yeah. So I think what you're hitting on here is the future of warfare is much less platform centric than right. it is today. It's data centric, it's information centric, and it's all about the linkage between sensors and decision makers and shooters. Right. And those things don't have to happen in the same airplane. Right. So the follow on to JSTARS doesn't have to have a, a radar for ground moving target indication and air battle managers right. in the back of it. That, right. that's, that doesn't have to happen. Uh, but it's all about the ability to move enough information at speed and scale to allow thousands of kill chains to be closed in hundreds of hours. And there has to be a decision maker in every single one of those loops. Right. We are not yet this town, this country is not yet ready for autonomous kill chains, and right. we're not either. Right. So there has to be a decision maker in each of those loops. And one of the things you asked about was how do you leverage uh, information? Mm -hmm. One of the things you have to do is leverage auto, uh, artificial intelligence as well, because there will be so much information coming right. in. And if you consider that there has to be a decision maker in each of those kill yeah. chains, you have to filter that data down to only that which is relevant, right. or you become overloaded so quickly that, that it becomes ineffective and the pace of the campaign suffers because of it. Right, so it requires a, a quite a bit of engineering and tailoring of that AI-enabled analytic capability to it make does. sure it's giving the decision maker just enough to support the decision, but not so much that they become overwhelmed or it's extraneous information that may actually be distracting. Absolutely. And the, the last thing to that is that we have to be able to trust that data, yeah. right? Right. So right. very, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and as you also hinted at, right, not only at, you know, am I, do I have to look beyond my organic platform to other sources of data, I'm looking to other services. Maybe I have to look to allies. 
uh, that becomes yes. much more joint and much more richly interlinked, which again has to be Absolutely. quite a challenge in development and test. And the same for engagement. Yeah. Doesn't matter where the weapon comes from. Right. So the challenge, I think, from the programming perspective is, you know, getting back to Dan's earlier question about how do you program for this, um, how do we program for that, the glue, you know, that allows you to connect the, this disparate collection of uh, assets for gathering information and then decision makers and weapons yep. because it's not all in one, you know, easy bucket. It's not, and if it were, it would be awesome. Right, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> and so the way we think about this is in terms of mission engineering threads. Okay. And we try and look from end to end uh, if you want to look at the long-range air-to-air kill chain, how, how does it start? Where do you get data from a sensor? What sensors do you have? How are they linked together? Where does that information go? This is, okay, right. if right. there's a decision maker in each kill, where is he? Right. Where is she? <laughs> right. What role are they playing? And how do you get that information back out to the shooters, to mm -hmm. the weapon, to include an in-flight target update if required, yep. uh, and, and actually cause an effect on the battlefield? And so the, the key is to understand the things that need to occur and if you understand the things that need to occur, you can understand the mechanism by which they occur, and therefore the equipment which needs to be part of this, yeah. and do we have it or do we not? And if we don't, let's go get it, and now you have a list of line items that you're actually ready to program into the budget. Right, right. right. Um, I wanted to alert everybody, we're gonna open it up to questions from both the in-person and online audience, so uh, if you have questions, uh, sort of uh, prepare those, and I will call on you, and hopefully so there are some. And uh, Morgan, um, can you let me know if there's questions from online? Yes, okay, good. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, another thing I wanted to ask, electronic warfare, electromagnetic warfare is one of the topics we wanted to address here. Um, and the, uh, the, other, the, the Army in particular, um, and to a degree the Marine Corps, are both pursuing this kind of family of systems concept. They're feeling everything from the individual soldier, Marine level, up to the you know, kind of regiment or, or battalion level and, and brigade level in terms of uh, electronic warfare systems. How does the Air Force view its, you know, building out its electromagnetic warfare capability? Is that, you know, it's not the same kind of deal that the ground troops have where you've got systems that a, a soldier carries all the way up to what a vehicle might carry in concert with a brigade. It's on individual platforms or it's, you know, in, you know, space-based systems or something. How do, how do you view that? that combination of systems that was going to provide that ability to get electromagnetic spectrum superiority. And so um, if, if you've heard of the, uh, the Secretary of the Air Force's um, operational imperatives, right? So he, uh, uh, two years ago, got, we got on this um, uh, uh, a path of deep analytics mm -hmm. uh, analysis as to determine what are the things that we really need to, to buy in the future. Uh, so one of those was uh, electromagnetic spectrum operations, and um, it, w it, it, it w didn't start the first year, so it's only been one year. We've just finished the report just a couple of months ago, and uh, and has a number of recommendations as to where it is that we think we should go. So I won't go into you know what it is that we will get or or not type of thing, but from a recommendation standpoint, I think that we we really need to be thinking about um, what are the not so much electronic protection because that's the yeah. role that we've been in for a long time. Um, when uh, you know, from a roles and missions perspective, the Navy took on electronic attack uh, many many years ago. So we've we focused quite a bit on electronic protection. Though we've had um, a, you know compass call, mm -hmm. and and we will continue. We'll build out the uh, EC. EC-37, yes, um, uh, here in the next, uh, actually I think in the next year or two when we'll get to EC-37, we'll get by 10 of those type of thing. But um, uh, so an we need to be thinking about and prioritizing ourselves with strategic or uh, electronic attack um, as opposed to just the electronic protection. And then what are the techniques that, uh, that will come with that uh, electronic attack. Cognitive electronic warfare, mm -hmm. um, so software defined, right? I mean, it doing its thing um, all by itself, not, you know, right? No human being in the loop on, uh, on how does it determine um, how it's being attacked, where it's being attacked from, and then what, you know, how does it do, uh, take on the mission itself type of thing. And then it's, and then again, it's institutional, uh, we, institutionalizing this for the service. Um, so we, we really need to build out our capability, our expertise, and I'm talking about manpower. People have to be doing this 
Uh, and so the spectrum warfare wing, just being able to stand that up, um, uh, fulfilling the, 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 you know, the number of um, officers and uh, enlisted members that we'll have there, standing up the next group, that type of thing, I mean, that's going to help us. It, the, very much from the Air Force leadership perspective, we are investing in this area. It's just, uh, uh, we, we've just got to get after it, and we've got to get after it as quickly as we can. Right, I mean, that a good, brings up a good point, is that there's this transition from a roles and missions um, you know, conversation where the Navy was largely taking on this role of being the electronic attack provider to mm -hmm. naval and air forces, yep. Um, yep. and in terms of controlling the spectrum, you know, and I think, but, but I think, you know, resident in the Air Force, there's a lot of, you know, electronic attack capability that could be brought to bear. It's just inherent in other platforms. You have 35, you know, sure. collaborative combat aircraft are going to incorporate it. I think EPAWS probably has a lot more uh, electromagnetic um, offense capability than, than we probably give it credit for because it's treated mostly as a defensive system. But sure. so it seems like there's a lot of the raw materials there. It's a matter of changing the mindset from being just protecting our own use of the spectrum to denying it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Dan, did you have to? I don't. Oh, good. Well, because I, I, well, I'm going to, I have other questions here, but uh, we'll turn to the audience though to see if uh, we have questions from the audience. Um, you know, we'll bring the microphone around if you have questions. Morgan, are there questions from the online audience? Okay, the gentleman up here in the front, we'll start with. With the post events. <laughs> yeah. So if you could say where you're from and then uh, what your question is. Um, I'm Franklin, I'm from Washington, D.C. And my question is specifically to General Lauderback. Um, you talked about China's, I think you said China surpassed salute the U.S. And so in relation to that, what plan does the Pentagon have in addressing that, especially with the weather balloon over, I think, a couple months ago with China, I feel like infiltrating the U.S. So what plan does the uh, Pentagon have in remedying that? Okay, yeah, great, thank you. So I wouldn't say that uh, China has surpassed us. Um, so you remember what I said, I talked about China, for them it's a home game. Um, and then uh, uh, we have a global, you know, world-class military already, and we've been operating that for decades. Um, so that is their goal, is to get to that, and 2049 is the, the year that they've given theirself, themselves the, the goal for. Um, so I wouldn't say that they've surpassed us, but it is a significant challenge uh, in the Pacific if we were to, um, if we were to you know, uh, become in a conflict or, or into close competition or crisis, I would say. Um, so you, when you say, like, oh, we'll use the balloon as an example, um, I would tell folks that uh, China and that modernization that they've done with uh, their ISR capabilities, right, their intelligence collection capabilities on orbit um, is much, much greater than what it is that, um, that a balloon uh, will offer, okay? Uh, the, um, and so you know, I would just tell you that uh, I, that was a significant event, certainly, for a balloon to be flying over the United States. Uh, and, I, and from that, uh, we certainly, you ask because how are we operating that from a, the Pentagon or responding to that from a Pentagon perspective. Um, so you'll, you'll remember that we have combatant commands and we have a North, uh, NORAD NORTHCOM, which is the combatant command for the defense of the United States. And, uh, and they absolutely have taken those lessons and you know, learned that to, uh, applied that to um, how, it is that we would, uh, how it is that we would defend ourselves in a quicker manner, perhaps, or, or however it is that the, uh, the policy, uh, uh, policy folks will allow us to do that. Yeah. Well, I, I can't answer that from, right, Leah Lauterbach's understanding, but what I'll tell you is that, I mean, what we, you know, right, what, what had been said in the press and, and how the Department of Defense answered that question already um, is, right, there, uh, there was a, 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 a decision that was made, um, and the decision was made because, right, um, I'll, I'll just decline. How about that? I will decline <laughs> to answer any more to that because I know I've got other folks on the line here, uh, but we've already answered that uh, um, from a Department of Defense and from a, uh, a national security perspective. Yeah. Right, next question uh, in the back. Hi, uh, my name is Jared Case. Um, from here in Washington, D.C. I'm an RF engineer, and I appreciate this conversation because I think a lot of times, uh, uh, I think there's a lot of conversation now that seems to I think criticize, I think the funding and, and, and I think when it comes to spectrum and license, unlicensed, DOD, um, and the commercial side not working together, but how, in terms of workforce development, how, do, how can we better bridge uh, 
I think capabilities that clearly I think engineers and, and, and a lot of technical folks in the military are doing with people who are trying to, uh, on the commercial side, make sure that we can still be a, a dominating figure and not China when it comes to um, a spectrum in the yeah. future. So a, a couple of things on this. First of all, most of the development of equipment, we don't do ourselves. The defense, in, the defense industrial base does that. And so they're the ones that are that are bringing on new engineers and, uh, and new developers and building hardware uh, that accomplishes the kind of things we're talking about here. However, how many of you are from local school today? Okay, cool. Um, why does this matter? Is this the most fun thing you've ever done in your whole life in this school? <laughs> Love it. Okay, why this matters is because that workforce, regardless of whether we do it ourselves or whether we have folks that help with the integration or whether the defense industrial base does it, if you want to talk about our highest end adversaries, you have to talk about our highest end capabilities. Only 25% of the STEM graduates from college in the United States every year are US citizens. And for the defense industry, the highest end workforce, that's where that workforce comes from. And as that percentage stays fairly small, the workforce that's even available to be a part of this is fairly small. And so that is a limit on our capacity to develop and incorporate new equipment that is able to create new effects. Nevertheless, our defense industrial base is highly capable and is doing this at speed and scale. Um, so we, we are able to do this successfully, but it has to be very carefully managed. And what you're, what you're kind of, I think what you're implying is that workforce is precious and it is a national asset. And if we want to have high-end capabilities, we better take care of and develop that workforce. And you could not be more correct. And in general, I think you know the, the, the DOD is using a lot more commercial capabilities or leveraging a lot more commercial capabilities for uh, electromagnetic spectrum systems. You know, we're putting 5G. Yep. You know, Any together, chance we get. And, right. And, and using commercial capabilities. So you're leveraging a commercial industry that, you bet. that also generates the, the equipment that is used by right. citizens. Yeah. Right. But there are a lot of things that we do that industry has no interest in right, whatsoever. Right, exactly. Yeah. They have no, no interest in a phased array seeker for the head of a missile. Just <laughs> There's not, not a lot of business for that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next question, uh, Mark. Hi, uh, Mark Melton, I'm here at Hudson. My question, you were talking earlier about um, kill chains and taking the information, making the decision, and then getting that to uh, the shooter. Um, with the war in uh, Ukraine, are there any examples of how the DOD is learning from that conflict to help make decisions of how we might uh, take some good lessons from that for future conflict? So I think we are. I think we probably both have some thoughts on this. I think we are, but I'll tell you the number one thing that we're learning from the conflict in Ukraine is that the reason this is a protracted ground war is because neither side has the ability right now to gain or maintain our superiority. And therefore, what remains is a long slog on the ground. And so if you translate that forward into the China fight and you want to maintain or even be able to attain air superiority over the distances of the Pacific against the capabilities that the Chinese bring to bear, you had better be very, very serious about air superiority. And so this is where we, where, uh, where we, where we point our program is towards the ability to gain and maintain, even if only uh, temporarily for post operations, air superiority in the Chinese theater. And so some, some pretty high-end investments, uh, the most notable that you'll see uh, on the platform side is next-gen air dominance and then next-gen uh, air-to-air missiles as well. That's, that's the number one lesson I think that we're taking from Ukraine. Yeah, from my perspective, uh, two things uh, on the intel side of the house. One is the commercial capability that, uh, you know, if it's Starlink or uh, commercial imaging, cap imaging capabilities brought, uh, brought to bear. Uh, that, that is just, you know, it wasn't something that was new to us, but the, um, the ability to use this, the, the scale of it, um, and, and so rapidly, uh, I, th I think was something that, um, uh, yeah, we just need to understand as to how can we use that, uh, for, uh, you know, to inform ourselves. Uh, that would also include um, uh, privately, or I'm sorry, publicly available information or commercially available information, right? PAI, CAI is things that we... Uh, bring in from a uh, data perspective for Intel and turn that into, uh, uh, or data and turn it into Intel. Um, the second thing is the ability to use commercial capabilities like that uh, allows you to share it uh, much more rapidly with the uh, with partners. And so, it, right, because it's not classified or it's uh, classified, whatever, right? I mean, it's something that you can 
uh, we need to, uh, we just need to uh, do more of that um, so that I've been in so many uh, conflicts uh, so, on so many ops floors where it is, it's difficult to share the intelligence that we're ga gathering or the planning that we're doing uh, with um, our coalition partners. And we know that we're not going to be able to be, we won't be successful in really any uh, conflict in the future without partners. Um, so I, that's a big lesson as well that uh, I know we've, we've gotten from an intelligence uh, perspective out of that. There's, there's a related theme uh, that, that I'd like to, to probe here. So one of the things we've seen in Ukraine is the rise of these improvised kill chains, if you will. You talk about PAI, CAI, you know, um, applications on, on handheld phones, Starlink links, and you know, people are kludging together kill chains that are at least somewhat effective. If, we think about the agility that that, that that creates, and we try to you know, map that back to the Air Force. One of the things we talked about is uh, high-end kill chains, where we're going to take a deliberate approach. We're going to have mission engineering. We're going to identify the things that, that aren't working. And very often, when you get into those details, they're, they're you know, nidinoid things. That there's a something I can't stuff into a J-series message, and I have to modify software to be able to do that. But when I modify software, I create the opportunity for vulnerabilities in my networks. How do you balance agility, the ability to improvise, and the need for security? How are you well, thinking about that? Let's not get too excited about what's going on with that in Ukraine, because the phenomenon you talk about is very real, but dozens of them, not thousands of them. Yeah. And so the ability to adapt absolutely has to be a part of this, but we have to also understand that fundamentally the requirement is thousands of kill chains and hundreds of hours. That implies that you have to have already figured much of this out ahead of time because the, the time that it takes to improvise at that scale, you don't have it. Uh, I, well, I'm just thinking about, um, uh, uh, this might be a little bit more difficult, uh, complex of an answer. The, um, the Air Force has, through all of our, you know, those manned and unmanned aerial um, ISR capabilities that we've had over the last couple of decades, we've developed what we've called, uh, the architecture is called uh, the DCGS. And this is a lot of airmen that we have that um, are doing exploitation of this MQ-9, this, right, whatever, whatever it is. And we did it in a very stovepiped manner. Um, and so in 2018, uh, we, the, um, you know, I, I'll say it wasn't fast agility. I don't know. Is there a slow term to agility? Right? <laughs> but we did change, Government right? Government service. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we did change. And how we changed to is the, um, a, prob a problem-centric approach, but using multi-intelligence capabilities. Um, so whether that is SIGINT or IMINT or uh, if it's a CAI, PAI, whatever it is, right? So we've developed teams within um, the, the DCGS uh, at uh, various core sites that we have around the world so that they're looking at what are the problems, but it's all, you know, problems and the answering the, in the information, uh, trying to provide the information for uh, the commander or the, the decision maker. Uh, but again, multi-int um, multi um, you know, look, as opposed to, again, the stovepipes that we've had in the past. And I can tell you in, in this crisis, uh, we're getting a lot of reps and sets in. Um, so it is really helping us out. Uh, and we're, we're getting better, uh, faster, um, and I'll just leave it at that. But uh. right. it, it seems like one of the things that Mark kind of got at when the war, with war in Ukraine is you know, the air defenses, uh, the lack of air superiority that you mentioned, General. Um, part of that derives from just the, the capacity limitations of the, the participants, but it also, become, it's all, also comes because they don't really have a suppression of enemy air defense capability on either side. Um, it seems like non-kinetic methods of suppressing air, enemy air defenses not are- Not quite yet. Right, not quite yet. Right, right. So um, that seems to be like a, a, you know, a big difference in, in that it's not just about you know, blowing up somebody's air defenses with a harm missile or whatever. It's got, you've got to be able to do it at scale, as you said. So you've got to be able to probably do it non-kinetically using either stealth or electromagnetic warfare if you want to do it. Is that, um, is or, that something or, that- Or cyber warfare. Or cyber warfare, right. So it seems like that should be it, where we're looking in the future to try to suppress air defenses, not so much mm -hmm. as blow everything up mm -hmm. you know, target by target, but maybe focus on trying to suppress it for a period of time. Any, any way we can, we're looking yeah. at it. Yeah. Right, okay. So other question, oh, there's a question from online. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, there's a question from online from Frank Wolf from Defense Daily. He asks, how much did the Air Force request in fiscal 2024 for the development of Northrop Grumman's APG-85 radar for the F-35 and what are Air Force plans to test the radar and when? Uh, I think we're going to get outside the, the yeah. limits of this conversation really <laughs> right. quickly. Sorry. The APG-85 is a fantastic radar. Um, we, we, uh, we intend to procure that for the F-35. That's the radar that we intend to use going forward. The, the rest of that, um, we'll, we would have to talk about that in a different forum, unfortunately. 
Uh, but it's a new radar to replace the, or the APG-81. radio, the yep. APG-81, right, okay. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, oh, wait a minute, uh, let's see, we'll give somebody else a chance. There we go. Uh, She'll bring the microphone around, that way you can. <laughs> I'm from DC, and I'm wondering, uh, like, when you look at conflicts like maybe the war in Iraq, where on the first day, uh, you know, like the shock and awe campaign, we have air superiority, air dominance. When you shift that into, you know, a conflict with like a near peer adversary, and especially when you get into, you know, the cyberspace, like where we're not, we don't necessarily have the capability to send aircraft to China where our operational goals are. How do we make sure that, you know, we don't get sort of caught up in the conflict of like initially who has that sort of cyber advantage and keep on like, you know, actually making sure there's aircraft and pilots and missiles and bombs involved, you know, like is that sending standoff weapons from a longer distance or is that, you know, keeping on sending planes in but having more electronic warfare? What does that look like? What was your name again? Layton. Layton. Okay, I'm going to sign you up to come in. Yeah, <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a conceptual answer, and then we'll go maybe one level down. The conceptual answer is what you're talking about is the ability to coordinate across domains. You can't just think about airplanes. You can't just think about undersea capability. You can't just think about cyber. You have to think about all of them together. And so what you have to do is understand how all of those things will come together and then how you'll counter them, and then come in behind that with your own effects. For example, we don't necessarily view the China campaign as an air dominance, an air supremacy campaign like Iraq was. We don't think we'll have that, but we do believe that we'll be able to create air superiority for pulsed operations. And all of the domains that you talked about, plus one major one that you didn't, which is space, um, those all have to come together in order to create that air superiority for pulsed operations. And we have seen in war game after war game after war game uh, that the space domain is one of the most important domains for determining the outcome. Um, there is also one fundamental difference between China and Iraq. China is a nuclear armed adversary and Iraq wasn't. And so this constrains the thinking when you consider what the target set might be and what you're able to hit. Um, it is probably pretty reasonable to think that you would be very careful before you would start trying to blow up central Beijing as we did with central Baghdad. That model is, you're, there has to be some additional thinking because China has capabilities that Iraq didn't and we do not want a nuclear exchange. There's no part of this that is supposed to ever lead to a nuclear exchange. And the war games will tell you, you central Beijing, if, if you want to start a nuclear exchange, that's actually a pretty good way to do it, is go after a bunch of targets in central Beijing. So um, in any case, this is all about multi-domain operations uh, and sustained multi-domain warfare. Have you, um, maybe you've heard the term uh, CJADC2, or you've, maybe you've heard the term JADC2, so Joint All Domain uh, Command and Control. And then they've, we've added, since added a C on the front of that, so it's now um, coalition, right, or combined. Uh, JADC2, because again, we're not going to do any fight without our uh, coalition partners. The, uh, but this, it's not just, it's exactly what General Moore is speaking about, um, but uh, what I would add to the CJADC2 is the, the ability to see to all of that, to command and control all of that, so that you're, you know, right, you're uh, synchronizing all of those operations across all of those domains. Uh, uh, hard stuff, but that's absolutely what we're thinking about. And the war games that General Moore speaks to is that, you know, each of the services does war games and experimentation and exercises, and then we do those things together um, so that we, you know, because every problem out there is a, has a different solution to it. Um, and, and we do that thinking uh, certainly within uh, the Department of Defense. So I think we have time for one more question. Uh, let's see, the young lady right there. Her fastest. Thank you. Um, I'm Gigi, I'm from Houston. Um, okay, so General Lauterbach, you mentioned like autonomous weapons and warfare and that our tech in that arena isn't ready to operate without human interference and like sign offs on final decisions. And I'm curious, are you concerned in any way that other large military powers like don't have that same check on autonomous warfare or like on another vein? Um, do you think that like when we get to a point where autonomous warfare can operate without human control, like do we still have an ethical duty to keep humans involved? Mm. Um, what's your outlook on that? 
Good question. It was him. It was him yes, that right. said it. So, uh. so, there, so, so you've asked you've asked a, a truly important question, and yep. one of the one of the things that is a, a salient feature of the Department of Defense's budget in twenty four is exploration into ethical AI, and that takes several forms. The first one is what do we think we're allowed to. Uh, we're allowed to let AI do. The second one is how do we know how the algorithm made decisions and do we trust it? And the third one is at what point are we ready to let the algorithm start doing some things on its own that maybe we are or aren't comfortable with? You can read about this in uh, Chris Brose's book, Kill Chains. Mm -hmm. One of the chapters he talks extensively about whether you would trust a young soldier on the ground that maybe hasn't had sleep in three or four days and hasn't had a, a good meal or certainly a shower he probably should have made a good decision early and joined the Air Force. Nevertheless, um, this young soldier that heat, sweat, fatigue, all of that is making a decision about employing lethal force or not, or an algorithm that never gets tired. You might actually think that if you can understand how, how the algorithm makes decisions and trust it, you might rather have that algorithm that never gets hot and never gets tired and never gets hungry, you might rather have it making decisions for you. But until you have in place the foundations of ethical AI that allow that to happen, you, you can't get there. So it, it, is, it is a very important discussion. It's one that's being had at the very highest levels of the Department of Defense. In fact, I'll tell you, it is an emphasis area of the Deputy Secretary of Defense. She, in particular, is very concerned that we approach this in a way that matters. What will the adversary do? It depends who plays by the rules of warfare and who doesn't. There are societies uh, that have a very different foundation than ours. They're not Regardless of what your beliefs are, our society is a Judeo-Christian society, and we have a moral compass. Not everybody does. And there are those that are willing to go for the ends, regardless of what means have to be employed. And we'll have to be ready for that. Excellent. Well, you know, one, one caveat to that is that you know, the AI or the algorithm may not be accountable in the same way that a human might be. For Even sure. if it doesn't get tired, you can't take it to uh, court martial. You can afterwards. unplug it. That's right. You can unplug it. That's right. <laughs> But it won't, it doesn't care if you unplug it. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, you know, General Lauterbach, uh, General uh, Moore. Um, but before we close up, I wanted to make sure that um, I gave you an opportunity to kind of, to maybe summarize, you know, some of the takeaways you want uh, folks to bring from, you know, the FY24 effort, what, where the Air Force is going in cyberspace and electromagnetic spectrum and, and with intelligence um, before we, we break up and, and close here. Yeah, I will just say, uh, so uh, uh, the Secretary of the Air Force that we have, um, Secretary Kendall now, having us focused on the modernization uh, of what it is that we need to do to be successful in a uh, in a conflict or crisis with uh, with China is absolutely the right uh, the right path uh, that we're on. I mean, it was uh, the the last 20 years, 22, 22 years of of the operations that we were doing, um, all good stuff, all right. I mean, very important, significant to uh, national security, but. Um, but all in a permissive, uh, mostly in a permissive environment from an Air Force perspective. And so uh, getting uh, prepared for that high-end fight, uh, we're, we're on the right path, uh, but we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, so I agree, and I'd just like to say thanks. We really appreciate the hospitality, and we appreciate any opportunity to tell our story directly. It means the world to us, and we appreciate the, the chance to give you the thought process behind what's on the Hill right now. It's easy to see what the numbers in the budget are. Sometimes it's a little more challenging to understand the thought process behind it, and we appreciate the ability to share that. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, General Leah Lauterbach. Uh, thank you, General Rick Moore, uh, for being here today. Um, and uh, thank you all uh, for being here and for your terrific questions. Uh, and for me and Dan Pat, uh, thank you from the Hudson Institute, and have a great day. <laughs>